Hello, and welcome to Fairview Baptist Church. I'm Pastor John Boyacek. I'm so glad you could join us in worship today. I trust that you will be blessed. Good morning. It's good to see you. Good to be back with you. Uh, Thursday of this week, I felt the Lord directing me to a different message for today. And uh, so we hope that was from the Lord and not the holdover from too much Christmas turkey. <laughs> but uh, we'll trust that it was from the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 12 this morning. Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah chapter 12, I'll give you a little extra time to find that because that's not as easy to find as some. Jeremiah 12, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Righteous are you, O Lord, when I complain to you, yet I would plead my case before you. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all those who are treacherous thrive. You plant them and they take root. They grow and produce fruit. You are near in their mouth and far from their heart. But you, O Lord, know me. You see me and test my heart toward you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and set them apart for the day of slaughter. How long will the land mourn and the grass of every field wither for the evil of those who dwell in it? The beasts and the birds are swept away because they said, he will not see our latter end. If you have raced with men on foot and they have wearied you, how will you compete with horses? And if in a safe land you are so trusting, what will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? For even your brothers, the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. They are in full cry after you. Do not believe them, though they speak friendly words to you. This also is God's word. I remember as a teenager, uh, 15 years of age, we were living in the Chicago area at the time, and my folks uh, were invited to dinner with some people they knew. I did not know them. They lived about a half an hour away, and several of the kids went with them. Uh, for this dinner. They didn't have any kids. They were a little older. And so I was bored to death. And I began looking through their uh, record albums. Remember those? Uh, looking through there and came across one that had the title, If Footmen Tire You, What Will Horses Do? And I'd never heard that song or didn't know that artist. So I pulled it out and began looking at it. Well, lo and behold, it was a record of a sermon that had been preached. And I don't know now who the individual was who preached it, but it had to do with uh, his warning to the American people of the inroads of communism. This is in the late 1960s, 69, 70 era, era. So, you know, that was a big deal back then. Uh, the inroads of communism. And he was saying to the American people, listen, if you're struggling in, with Christian living, with all the freedoms you have, how are you going to do under communism? You know, if you're having trouble running with the footman, what are you going to do when the horses come? And so that was the title of his message. I didn't listen to the sermon, uh, but I've always been intrigued with this passage ever since that time. And so I want us to take a look at it this morning. It was an age-old question that had risen in the mind of the beleaguered prophet. Uh, he was talking to the Lord one day, and as verse 1 indicates, he was giving due respect to the Lord. Righteous are you, O Lord. Lord, you always do the right thing. 
I'm aware of that. I recognize that. I admit that. But he had a question in mind, actually two questions, but they were with the same intent. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? And why do all those who are treacherous thrive? Now, we want to look at how he assesses their wickedness and treachery. In verse 2, You, Lord, plant them and they take root. They grow and produce fruit. You are near in their mouth and far from their heart. Their lives are prosperous. It's because you have planted them, Lord. Maybe you've struggled with a similar question. You know, you hear about these drug lords who bask in their billions while multiplied millions of people suffer with addictions. You hear of the trafficking of, of human beings and those who traffic them bask in wealth while well, multiplied millions suffer. You say, well, Lord, what about this? What about this? But I don't think that's really where Jeremiah was coming from on this. I think he was looking more around at the people in Jerusalem and in the area around Jerusalem. Family, as we'll see in verse 6. Some of them were members of his own family, neighbors, acquaintances. These were people, as he says, to whom God was near in their mouth, but far from their heart. You see, Jeremiah was living under the godly reign of Josiah. King Josiah was a, was a very good king. He brought a lot of very positive reforms to the nation of Judah. They, they, they were thriving under his leadership. However, it was imposed from the top down. It wasn't from the heart out. So there was imposed morality. There was imposed, there was legislated righteousness, but there wasn't heart righteousness. And Jeremiah saw that and knew that. Yet in spite of that, a lot of these people were doing just fine, thank you very much. And we can struggle with the same thing. Sometimes as believers, we have all kinds of problems that our unsaved neighbors don't have. Why are they doing so well? And why am I suffering with this or struggling with that or facing this? And we wonder, just like Jeremiah. Now, if you've ever been bothered by people like that, I, I hope you didn't come to the conclusion that Jeremiah came to in verse 3. Lord, you know me, you see me, you test my heart. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter. Lord, make lamb chops out of them. Have you ever prayed that prayer? My brother-in-law says that this is his life verse. <laughs> I hope not. I don't want it to be my life verse, and I don't want it to be yours. Make lamb chops out of them. Deal with them. Lower the divine boom on them. This is what his uh, prayer was. In verse 5, God answers Jeremiah. And this is really where we want to spend the bulk of our time today. Things have been relatively peaceful so far, Jeremiah. You've been living under the godly reign of Josiah. Uh, but, but, Jeremiah, things are going to get tougher. Things are going to get a lot more difficult down the road for you. Jeremiah, you've been in a foot race with people and you're struggling. 
How are you going to do when the horses come? And you have to deal with that. Or to change the metaphors as God does here. Uh, if in a safe land you are so trusting, what are you going to do in the thicket of the Jordan? Uh, along the Jordan River was a floodplain, but there was also dense vegetation on that floodplain. And there were a number of animals that thrived in those thickets along the Jordan, including, including the Asiatic lion during Jeremiah's day. So there are a number of wild animals living in that space. But when the Jordan River flooded, it made that space less available. And it moved the animals out to the outer edges of the thicket. So there was less for them to survive in. And it made competition greater. And God is saying, you know, Jeremiah, one of these days, Jerusalem is going to be surrounded by the Babylonians. And it's going to get tough for you to survive. Because first of all, you are going to be persona non grata because you're going to preach that they should surrender to the Babylonians. And that's not going to be a message that's going to go over real well. You're going to end up in prison. Uh, food security is going to be a huge issue uh, in the besieged city. How are you going to manage under that food insecurity? How are you going to manage when, when they conspire against you? When ultimately they take you to Egypt against your will, even though you are preaching against those who go to Egypt, and they drag you off with them. How are you going to manage when, when the horses come riding along and you have to race with them? Jeremiah, how are you going to do? Jeremiah's ministry, for the most part, was fruitless, thankless, heartbreaking. I mean, he is not called the weeping prophet for nothing. His ministry was difficult from the get-go, but at least God tells him up front, here's what you're going to be facing. You see, for most of us, our Christianity works really well when everything's going well. When life is serene, uh, the winds and waves are calm, we can trust Jesus with the best of them. But you throw in a storm. We start grabbing for the life jackets of human wisdom and human solutions rather than calling on the Lord and considering his word. Most of life is a foot race with routine. We know that. We run against temptation for one thing. The daily struggle with sin that according to Hebrews 12, 1, so easily besets us, entangles us, ensnares us. The word beset means to stand easily around. The ESV has clings so closely. The sin which clings so closely to us. There's no social distancing when it comes to sin. It's right there, right next to us ready to trip us up at the first opportunity. Cosmos Ndeti was a marathoner from Kenya. He had never won a major race. In February of 1993, a friend invited him to a Bible study. And Cosmos went there, and he heard the gospel for the first time. And as a result of talking to his friend, he trusted Christ as his Savior that night. He said, before I became a Christian, uh, I was smoking and drinking, hardly the best habits for a marathon runner. Anyway, he said, uh, in, in April of 1993, he entered the Boston Marathon, and he wrote on his shoes, with faith in Jesus, anything is possible. He said, I prayed, Lord, nobody knows me here in Boston. I'm not recognized by anybody. But through you, I can receive a miracle. He won the Boston Marathon in 1993. 
94, and 95. You see, the habits that had ensnared him, the sin that had stood so easily around him, was no longer able to do so because the Lord Jesus Christ enabled him. Now, I realize for some people, sin is not a foot race with others. It is the horses themselves because you face addictions and difficulties that are way, way beyond you. And truthfully, the temptations we face are beyond any of us. We all need God's help. So we run against temptation. Secondly, we run against circumstances. The frustrations of life that confront us all from time to time. Things that we face that, you know, things break down uh, at the most inopportune time. The unexpected bill arrives. The plans that we were counting on go up in smoke. Whatever it is. You know, it just, it happens to us all. Stuff happens in life. Good old Murphy's Law, you know, if anything can go wrong, it will. And some say Murphy was an optimist. (laughs) But we, you know, circumstances that just, whew, man, is running against things that are running against you, it seems. We run against people. Certainly in the context of Jeremiah 12, it indicates a weariness because of people. Some of them, as I mentioned, were members of his own family. As he ran for God and saw others getting ahead who shouldn't have, it affected his own ability to run. You know, people can affect your ability to run the race God wants you to run. When Margaret and I lived in, in Cannington, we entered the Lift Lock 10K in Peterborough uh, three or four different years. The last time we ran it, uh, I remember starting out and with, within the first 2K, this happened. You ran down a paved road and then you had to turn onto a dirt road, sharp right turn. And there was a car parked right there at the corner. And so we're like maybe six minutes into this, into this race, like a 40-minute race. And as I was coming up to that tur- turn, there were two guys ahead of me, both about my age at the time. And they were, oh, maybe four or five strides ahead. And as they turned to go around this car, the guy on the outside kind of put the squeeze on the guy in the inside up against the car. Well, the guy in the inside took a set of exception to that and shoved him out and said, don't you ever do that again. Well, the guy on the outside shoved him back. And then they started punching each other and swearing at each other as they were running. Now, I always thought running was a non-contact sport. <laughs> Apparently, there's an MMA version I didn't know about. I wanted to say, hey, guys, if I wanted to see a fight, I would have stayed home and watched the hockey game. Instead, I said, hey, guys, it's not worth it. And they drifted to opposite sides of the road in kind of a tenuous ceasefire. And I ran in between them and left them behind. <laughs> now, either one of them might have beaten me But neither of them did that day because they wasted valuable energy rumbling instead of running. Instead of keeping their focus this direction, they got this way, looking this way, and dealing with that. You know, it's going to be a long run if you get off-focused of what you should be looking at where your attention should be. If you miss that, you're going to have a long, long race. If footmen tire you, if it weren't for people, life would be so easy, wouldn't it? We're constantly faced with people who don't share our preferences, 
our passions, our priorities. People who don't see our vision, read our version, applaud our victories. People who have different expectations, different experiences, different expressions of worship. People who don't cue in our lines, don't quote our lyrics or quieten our lives. We get all bent out of shape by the creative diversity God has built into his people. Does that mean that there's no right and wrong? Of course not. There is right and wrong. I believe in absolute truth. That thing, things can be true for all people, all times, all places. Truth that is universal, constant, and objective. I believe in that. I don't believe that you decide what's right for you and I decide what's right for me. I believe that God has spoken truth. He has declared truth to us and is for everyone, everywhere, in all times. In the book of Judges, there's a saying that everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It's repeated several times in the book. And the book of Judges shows us what happens in a society when everyone does what is right in his own eyes. And believe me, you do not want a world like that. Unfortunately, that's to a large degree where our world is headed and is going. And that's frightening to me because God's already told us this is where this will lead. This is where it will end up. And we can read it and see it and say, is that what we want? Is that the world? But that's the world where everyone does what's right in his own eyes. When everyone says, I can decide what's right for me. You can decide what's right for you. Yeah, it's not a happy place. But not every issue demands that someone be right. Some issues simply demand that we extend grace. Warren Wiersbe told of his daughter, came home from school one day, came in the front door, slammed it, marched through the front room muttering, people, people, people. Went up the stairs into her room, slammed the door, and Dr. Wearsby, being the dialed-in dad that he was, thought there must be an issue with the lass. So he went up the stairs and knocked on the door. And she said, what? Uh, may I come in? She said, no. He said, why not? Because you're a people. <laughs> you know, sometimes you feel like you just want to go up, slam the door, shut the world out, but we also know that as believers, we can't do that. Christian living demands interaction with people. And if we don't do so with the grace of God extended through us, we're going to end up like Jeremiah saying, butcher them, Lord. I don't care if they are related to me. But that's only half the problem. The horses are coming. The horses are coming. As I said, Jeremiah had been living under the relatively peaceful reign of Josiah. But Jehoiakim, Zedekiah were going to follow. They were not good kings. And the Babylonians were coming to town. And things were going to get very difficult, as I mentioned earlier. Maybe your horses are going to come in the form of some life-threatening illness or some extended illness that you have to deal with. The death of a close loved one, a severed relationship that was important to you, the loss of a job, your house burns down. When I pastored in Markham, we had a Chinese lady from Singapore. And uh, she uh, was not a believer for a long time. She had a friend who was. A lady named Annie in Singapore. And Annie had witnessed to her on different occasions. But she had not yet received Christ. One night she was looking out her window. Sue Lee. And she 
she saw smoke and flame leaping into the sky in the next street over. And so she rushed over there and it was Annie's house that was burning down. It was just engulfed in flame. The, the firefighters were there trying to, to deal with it. And then she saw Annie down by the road. And she was walking over to her trying to think, what on earth, what on earth can I say to her? What on earth do I have to say? And she got to her. She saw this baffling serenity on Annie's face. And the first words out of her mouth to Sue Lee were these. God is so good. She ran with horses. She knew how to run with horses. If your faith isn't strong enough to enable you to run with footmen, you'll have hoof prints up your back when the horses come. But I've got good news for you. Apparently, a trained marathoner will beat a horse over the distance of a marathon every time. You see, the horse has speed. It has power. But the marathon runner has endurance. And when you run with endurance, the race that is set before you, you'll be able to handle the horses. And that's what Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 talk about. Oh, these pages. The only horses that can run forever live in Hollywood, by the way. Um, they're in the movies. But real horses can't run forever. But how do we run with horses? Well, not very well, unless we run with endurance the race that is set before us. According to Hebrews 12, to run with endurance means laying aside excess weights and the sins, which I mentioned earlier, the besetting sins that stand so easily around us. Weights refer to anything that will increase your fatigue over the long haul. Anything that will cause you to look at the horses galloping off into the sunset and say, ah, I can't keep up with them. Who does God think I am? I don't have a chance here. Things like attitudes, self-centered living, lack of the fruit of the Spirit evident in your life, lack of the use of the God-given gifts you have, these are weights. These are things that will weigh you down and keep you from running well the race that God has for you. And God's answer to our dilemma, get rid of those entangling sins that hold you back and those weights that slow you down and don't give up. I am able to see you through this. Just keep looking at Jesus. You see, he faced his horse the cross, and he endured that. Those are, that's the essence of Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. When I pastored in Markham, this, the seniors had a speaker. He was from Scarborough, Toronto somewhere. Can't even remember his name. But he, he was an unusually upbeat person. Had a very positive outlook on life. Uh, very inspiring, motivational in, in his speaking. Uh, and in the course of his talk, he shared these words. And I almost gag on them after the week we've had of miserable rain almost every day. But he said this, What's the use to worry and complain when it's just as easy to rejoice? If God sorts out the weather and sends the rain, then rain's my choice. I thought, Okay, wow, that's a great outlook. Now, what I didn't tell you was, this man was blind. And yet, he had that incredible outlook. He's somebody who knew how to run with horses. Do you know how to run with horses? Do I know how to run with horses? It takes endurance. It takes laying aside the sins and the weights that weigh us down, keeping our focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. 
Patsy Claremont shares this story, and with it, I'll close. She said one day her six, seven-year-old son was headed, heading out to catch the bus to school. A couple minutes later, there was a knock on the door, and she opened the door, and her son was standing there. He said, Mom, I don't want to go to school. It's too long, it's too hard, and it's too boring. She said to him, son, you've just described life. Now get on the bus. <laughs> she could have said to him, son, if footmen tire you, what will horses do? Let's pray. Lord, we do not know what this coming year holds, but I'm quite sure in your plan, at least some of us will have to run with the horses. Some have been running in 2023 very much with the horses. I thank you that you have helped sustain them in those difficult times. Continue to do so. It should, be, should it be the case that we have to run with the horses in 2024? May we run effectively so that others may see the grace and power of God at work in us. If, on the other hand, our year is one of running with the footman, may we likewise do that well and for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so glad you're able to join us today in worship. If you have a need, a prayer request, feel free to reach out to us at the church here. You can give us a call or you can also email us. God bless you.